This is the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 14th, 2023. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zoller, is coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. And this week we're going to look at the following developments that took place in federal taxes. First, we'll take a look at a case that was on appeal to the Seventh Circuit where the court decided the deduction for non-qualified deferred compensation was not accelerated for the seller when the liability was taken over by the buyer of the business in question. Second, we'll look at an IRS warning to tax professionals and taxpayers regarding certain employee stock ownership plan arrangements and uh, potentially especially a particular one involving management S corporations. Finally, we will look at a case where the court ruled that a reduction of non-recourse debt should be added to the sales proceeds, not considered a cancellation of debt. And that was important because the S corporation at the time of this transfer of the real estate was insolvent. So if 108 would have worked for them, they could have under 108 A1 or A2, I should say, have excluded the income because of insolvency. So we'll talk a little bit about that too and the rules involved with that. Let's start out first with a case involving an NBA team. And the name of the uh, taxpayer in this case was appropriately Hoops LP. Hoops LP was the owner of the Memphis Grizzlies, originally the Vancouver Grizzlies, but they moved to Memphis under their, let's say, ownership period. So eventually we're looking at the 2012 sale of the Memphis Grizzlies of the NBA. So this does not involve the current owner of the team. It involves the prior owner of the team. And the selling entity had, as often happens in professional sports, entered into deferred compensation arrangements, non-qualified deferred compensation arrangements, with, at this point, two of the players that had not yet been paid out. And the discounted present value of those outstanding arrangements at the date of the sale was $10.7 million. Now, as you can expect, the liability transferred to the buyer, but obviously the buyer would reduce, in theory at least, their purchase price by the $10.7 million. Now, obviously, we're talking about NBA franchises, and the total values in cases like this tend to get very high. Uh, so maybe that was pocket change in the whole thing, and nobody ever paid much attention to it. But certainly Hoops LP's partners would like to get a current deduction for that. So what they looked at was some potentially conflicting rules under the Internal Revenue Code. Generally, non-qualified deferred compensation arrangements are governed by Internal Revenue Code Section 404A5. And Section 404A5 generally provides that the employer will not be allowed to claim a deduction or the amount of a non-qualified deferred compensation arrangement, even if they've received all the services and the employee is now entitled to it. So it's a real liability that there would be an entitlement, but it's not yet been paid. Well, under 404A5, effectively, as the court phrased it, they're put on the equivalent of the tax basis of accounting. They can only pick that up in income in the year in which it is paid out and the employee will, I should say, they shouldn't be able to claim the deduction. In the year it's paid out, and the employee at that point would pick the amount up in income. This part of 404A covers all the various ways you can deduct various deferred compensation arrangements. And 404A5 is meant to disadvantage arrangements that are not qualified arrangements. Remember, qualified retirement plans are things you think of as 401Ks, uh, profit-sharing plans, similar structures. Those operate under rules that also ensure that they have to be operated in a way that's not discriminatory, at least in ways that the law doesn't allow it to discriminate. While, st while pure non-qualified deferred comp pretty much is write your own rules subject to 409 cap A that we now have, which can limit the abilities that you used to have in that area. The problem with going that route is while you, that, while you can limit the benefits to, like in this case, two particular very highly compensated employees of the organization. So we don't need, need to worry about, let's say, paying the ticket sellers, you know, and the, uh, the people that we have, ushers, et cetera, whatever we're paying for in the facility. 
You don't need to worry about covering them under this program and offering them the same benefit. But we have to face the fact that we're not going to get the upfront deduction we would get with a qualified retirement plan. Now, in this case, the issue, so that, that seems to make it clear, they're not, there's no deduction until the amount's paid. However, Regulation 1.461-4D5, 461 basically covers methods of accounting, timing, etc. And this is a regulation that outlines the accrual, overall accrual method of accounting, and in this case, in particular, an exception to that rule as to when, when we're going to change what's the standard rule. Generally, under accrual basis accounting, you end up with the all events test. And all events test basically boils down to, it's a little more complicated, but basically it boils down to generally that an accrual basis taxpayer is allowed deduction at the time two things have happened. Economic performance has occurred. So the parties have completed, aside from the payment, their economic responsibilities to each other. And there is, and the fact of the liability has been established. We can establish liability. We can reasonably estimate that value. And it is absolutely been established under the law. Now, in this case, it would seem both of those had happened. The players in question had completed their service and had earned that amount of future deferred compensation. They had completed their side of the contract. So they had their economic performance. Their deferred comp for that year was, you know, set. And the amounts we're talking about here are the amounts they had already completed the levels of service necessary and done whatever else they were going to do under their contracts to allow them to have the right to that payout. They were, you know, in essence, at this point, the NBA team was legally bound to pay them those funds at a point in the future. So economic performance had occurred and there was no question liability was fixed. You know, very fixed under those contracts. So normal accounting would say, under the standard general all events test, it would seem like the deduction would be allowed at the time. However, as noted under 40, basically under 404, under 404A5, I'll get the right number back out again, uh, we delay that deduction. However, this regulation says that upon the sale of a business, any item that would have been deductible except for a lack of economic performance is deductible by the seller at that time. So essentially, it would be deductible. Economic performance is our only issue, but the liability is there. Uh, we can claim a current deduction without waiting for economic performance. So the, I, the question becomes now, obviously, does this regulation override the standard rule found in the code at IRC 404A5. And the question, that's the question before the court. The taxpayer argued yes. Not surprisingly, you know, they're selling the team. They've taken a reduction in the sales price for the $10.7 million. Um, they want to go ahead and be able to claim that deduction now in this year of sale. You know, we're done with the business. We're closing up. Things are done we should be able to write that $10.7 million off because we effectively have constructively paid that amount out by taking that reduction in our purchase price. Now, the IRS disagreed, as did the tax court who ruled against the seller and said, nope, you're still bound by 404A5. You cannot claim the deduction because the amount has not yet been paid out and not yet been recognized in income by the players. And merely getting rid of your liability doesn't change that. So they appealed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals to see if they could get a different result. Now, the panel, because again, in most Court of Appeals cases, unless it goes, and normally this is on a second run when it would go to the court in bonk, or they decide it's one of those things that they're going to have the whole court hear it. Uh, there are panelists selected of three judges, randomly from all of the judges on the circuit court. So this is a panel of three judges who are judges of the circuit court of appeals, but they're going to rule on the case. So the panel in this case noted, and this was a unanimous decision of the panel, that economic performance really had occurred. As already mentioned, the players had performed their services. There was nothing left to happen at this point except a check to be written, right? And because of the nature of the contract and the nature after four, basically, after 409 cap A, 
um, of the issues that related to uh, in the economic performance that relate to the 409 cap a problems with non-qualified deferred comp that makes it very difficult to change that date. Well, you could change it, just the players are going to get absolutely clobbered tax-wise. So, and then that means they'll turn around and sue the team. So probably we don't want to, you know, mess with that at this point. Uh, basically saying, you know, we've got it done. The only thing left to be done is somebody's going to write a check. Now that somebody is going to be the new owners because as part of the sale, they assume this liability and they will pay it at the point the amount is due to be paid to those players. The panel says, well, that, that's great. So the only thing that stopped you from claiming the deduction was this provision of 404A5, which said you can't claim this deduction until such time as the players pick up an income, which basically means you're on the cash basis. You have to wait until cash is paid. Well, that's roughly what it says. But remember, what it really says is we have to pay it to the players. Now, the taxpayer obviously thinks that there's a deemed payment here. A, that's part of it. But B, they're saying under the reg, they should be able to claim the expense at this time. The question becomes, which statute controls in this case? Which provision? The reg under 461, so does the general rule of section 461 control, or does the specific rule at 404A5 control? Which one's in play? Generally, in analyzing a tax law, uh, a more specific provision of the code is going to take precedence over a more general provision in the law. The way the tax law is structured, and you know, it's a little quirky, uh, but you tend to have very broad general rules. And then you have all of these specific exceptions. For instance, under section 162, any ordinary and necessary business expense can be claimed as a deduction. But as we all know, there are numerous restrictions on that, right? We can't claim entertainment expenses. It doesn't matter if they are ordinary and necessary. If you are a cannabis dealer in a state where cannabis is legal, 280 cap E blocks you again. It steps in front of 162. Uh, you know, all of these special rules say, sorry, you can't claim it the way the general rule is because we have a more specific rule that covers your ability to claim the deduction and you have to meet the stricter more, more the stricter or maybe more liberal specific rule it controls instead of the general the panel concluded in this case that 404A5 was a more specific provision that demanded a different result from the general result under 461 and its regulations Nothing in section 404A5, the panel stated, suggested the rule is somehow different if that liability is transferred to another party before it's paid. They said, nope, the rule's simple. We are waiting for the players to have to pick it up in income. And until that happens, you don't get a deduction. Doesn't say anything about how you can accelerate that by not paying the players, but by paying a third party or indirectly paying a third party to go ahead and assume that payment liability in the future. That's not going to get you a current deduction. The panel did not agree, because this is the taxpayer's argument. They said, no, 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 404A5 delays the time of economic performance. And they said, nope, economic performance has clearly occurred under the standard definition that 461 works under. Rather, what was delaying things was the specific rule that said the deduction waited until the employees picked the amount up in income. That was your delay problem. It was not anything to do with the rules under 461 somehow being with, a, with this imposing a special economic performance test. So that waiver of economic performance that we found in the regulations under 461 is not going to be of use here. And they finally said, they said, look, Congress clearly intended, so they're going to congressional intent here. Although remember, they've already argued and claimed the plain language of the law requires this result, which makes this a bit superfluous, but they still go into it. They say, it's clear to us that Congress also intended for 404A5 to override any special rules in 461. They, as they said, effectively, it puts an accrual basis taxpayer on the cash basis, or at least close 
to the cash basis. And Congress intentionally wanted to discourage people from using non-qualified deferred comp, or at least they weren't going to give them the tax benefits they would give them if they would use a qualified program, which of course is subject to a lot more strengths. But that's the point. The idea was to encourage that. So because of that, they said, we, we see no compelling reason why Congress would have wanted to allow you to be able to get around all of that by merely disposing of or paying somebody else to take on the payment down the line. The court ruled effectively the seller is not going to get a deduction, so their partners will get no deduction until such time as the buyer actually pays those players. Now, the seller argued that, well, that, that, that's not very, you know, practical. You know, basically, A, you know, the partnership really, we're trying to wind the thing up. And secondly, you know, the seller doesn't really have to tell us when they paid them. You know, they don't have to share that evidence, so we'd have trouble proving it. And it's possible the seller will renege and, you know, won't actually go through with the payment. And so we'd lose the deduction, even though we reduced our purchase price. Now, in that case, to be honest, it seems like that the uh, Hoops LP is probably on the hook to the players because the players signed the deal with them and didn't really go ahead and agree to moving it to new company uh, to take care of the payment. So, you know, that might be a little iffier. But understandably, it's messy. The court said, not our problem. They, they said that you should have realized this, that the non-qualified deferred comp arrangements were not going to be deductible until they were paid. So in your agreement with the other entity, with your buyer, you should have taken this into account, perhaps changed the purchase price, perhaps had, you know, you could have used a qualified plan, which I consider a hilarious suggestion. Uh, either they don't know what they're, they, they don't know why that's not at all practical in this case, but still, you know, or they, they, they just wanted to make a point that they, you know, not, not, not really keen on this structure, but we understand the law allows it. I'm not sure why, but they said, you know, you could do any of that stuff. You could have arranged an earlier payment date when you negotiated this initially with the players, because even under 409 cap A, a change in control of the company can allow the payout to occur immediately. So you could have had that provision in there, you know, that, that would have said on a change of control, because that would change the risk that on that change of ownership control for the team that there would be the payment we do, and that would have accelerated the payment. Obviously, the players aren't likely to want to agree to that because they're asking for deferred comp for their own tax reasons, right? They don't want it all front-end loaded. And all this year, they want to spread it out over time. So various reasons why they prefer getting it in the future instead of getting it now, and especially instead of getting the discounted value now. Or what even, but even if it's a full payout, it's still going to be a problem. But essentially, as the court noted, it's just not their problem. This is what the law says. You should have understood that and you should have taken that into account when you negotiated your sale and got protections into the deal or got various other, you know, relief from the fact that this was going to work in this fashion going forward. Next, we're going to look at the IRS put out a news release this week. Internal Revenue News Release IR 2023-144 came out on August the 9th. It's entitled the IRS cautions sponsors to be alert to compliance issue to issues associated with ESOPs. Now, this is a nice change of pace because, as you know, until recently, all of these notices warning people to look out for these sorts of tax scams have all related to the employee retention tax credits, warning tax professionals and taxpayers to be aware of the scams that come up with the employee retention credit. So we're at least off that this time. But why is the IRS issuing this now? And as we'll discover, there is a specific program, which I have to believe the service has found being marketed, that they want to hone in on here. But they also realize that other structures could be created off of ESOPs uh, that could be abusive to favor or basically greatly reduce the tax of the owners, the highly compensated owners of the company, without really benefiting any of the rank and file. So they're looking for those type of arrangements that seem to go a little too far. Now, ESOP plans, they are basically, for all practical purposes, they're profit sharing plans, but 
they mainly invest or wholly invest in the stock of the sponsoring company. And we have various waivers for ESOPs that allow them to make those investments without you know, potentially being liable for not diversified, not offering good investment management because they have all of their shares are in the company. The point of this is to have the employees gain ownership of the company via this retirement program. So that was the point of all this. But it turns out that certain people have discovered ways to try to make use of the ESOP, perhaps in ways that weren't quite what they were sold on if you read the committee reports. You know, that when they came into the law, the whole point of these things, rather to try to move income and, you know, move benefits to the owners at the expense of the rank and file for various structures. So the focus is a part of the agency's program to increase, increase compliance for high income taxpayers. And so here's the basic structure, right? So what we're going to say here is the specific structure the IRS is looking at. They're going to say, here is a profitable business, right? So this business has a related S corporation form. So the business causes the S corporation to be formed, right? This S corporation will have all of its stock owned by the employee stock ownership plan. The S corporation provides vague management services, just something Gary puts it in quotes. And we've seen a lot of problems with management service businesses anyway. Um, if you remember the Aspro case we talked about back in 2022, you know, th this company for over 20 years had had a, had contracts with various other entities that were controlled by their shareholders to perform management services with no real definition of what it was, no real definition of what the payment should be, uh, no, no real issue you know, regarding that. So eventually the courts ruled effectively in ASPRO that there was no deduction allowed for the payments made to that entity. And since it was the C Corp, since the C Corp was the entity that was making the payments, supposedly ASPRO Inc., uh, they, they said, sorry, ASPRO has a lot of income for the years in question because we are going to disallow the deductions entirely. So their income is far higher. Well, that's a concept here too. As the court pointed out in ASPRO, generally officers of a corporation are required to provide management services. That's kind of like their duty. So the question becomes, why would a corporation with officers, which corporations have to have, why would they pay somebody else to manage it? And generally these also don't hold up well because the courts will also look to see if would any rational third party, would any rational company and an unrelated company ever enter into such an agreement. And while they might enter into a management operation for some things, the fact of entering into ones that tend to be run here, where even the amount they're gonna pay is left very vague and open, uh, no, people wouldn't probably sign that, right? Now, what happens is the S Corporation gets money from the business in an amount that seems basically determined to get the income out of that entity and into the S corporation, right? So we're going to get that over to the S corporation. The S corporation will pick up that income because the shareholder is an ESOP because an ESOP is allowed to hold those shares and it doesn't generate unrelated business income uh, for the unrelated business income tax. It's essentially considered to be just no, you know, non-taxed. That income flowing through to there in the S structure is non-taxed. And then what happens is the company then turns around the S corporation and effectively just loans this money back out on purported loans. And that's the term the IRS uses, purported loans, to the shareholder, or to basically to the uh, key people in the business that we're looking to benefit. And those loans, of course, are non-taxable because they're loans, right? Okay, right, we, we know how that goes. Right, so they loan those funds back to the business, all is well. And of course, the promoter's position is loans are, you know, receipt of loans is not taxable. The S corporation pays no tax, right? There's no tax at the S level. There's no tax up by the ESOP because it's an X level down. So effectively, they're going to defer paying tax on these amounts until such time as eventually they have to start getting distributions from the ESOP. 
So this could be a very, very long and extended period that there would be no tax paid on the earnings of the company. And as we said, and because we have the management company over here separate, we're in essence able to, under some structure, though try to figure out here, isolate off paying anybody else except the managers uh, for, the, for these benefits. So it also means we don't have to count anybody and really the ownership or control of the operation doesn't really change. And in one sense, almost who cares because the management company could just be ignored by the operating company. So interesting aside. The IRS not surprisingly disagrees with this treatment. And imagine why. The IRS position is the loans should be taxable to the individuals that they're being paid out to. That represents taxable compensation at that time. You know, we are just trying to, we're, we're trying to launder it by taking the earnings that they would have received, you know, and a good, and a lot of those earnings would have been paid out to them in compensation or paid out, let's say if it's a C Corp in dividends, we're trying to launder that to eliminate the tax on that, at least currently, and then turn around and take it out as a loan because now this management company has all this money sitting in it. So we're going to instead loan that money out after paying what's probably going to be very, very minimal salaries to these people in order to, you know, say, hey, look, yeah, we did this. Remember that? That's why it's an S Corp. It can work in the ESOP structure. And, you know, you're going to argue to get out of treating anything as compensation except very minor amounts. You're going to have a very minimal salary paid and a huge amount of loans. And of course, the promoter is going to claim, and you're safe from that because those aren't distributions, they're loans. IRS says they're not loans. The issue to remember about loans, if you ever get into a dispute over it, is in order for the courts to recognize a loan as a loan, the courts are going to look at a few things. First thing is, is it would a reasonable third party have made this loan under these conditions to this individual? If that answer is no, that they are getting sweetheart terms, then the courts will probably claim that that distribution represents something else. And under Section 61's broad definition of what's income, uh, that something else is probably going to be income. So we'll come to that. Number two, they are going to look for a written document. That's probably covered here. They're going to look for interest. That's probably covered. But then they're going to also look for an intent to repay the loan. And that's probably not at all present here. The whole point of this deal and how it was told, how they were sold it, was that no, you don't pay this back. You wait until the distribution years. And in those years, you'll probably end up with deemed distributions where you'll, you'll then put money back in. It'll turn back right around and be used to pay your benefit. So effectively, right, you're getting the money today and you're, def you're deferring paying the tax on that money until such time as we finally end up offsetting those loans. So IRS says, nope, that's not going to work. And as I mentioned, it is likely they will also challenge the deduction for management fees, the whole thing that transfers the income from the, from the operating business to the management S Corp owned by the ESOP. Now realize when they do that, it could be double trouble. What do I mean by that? Well, they could very well say, it's just not an ordinary necessary business expense. That's what ASPRO effectively said. It wasn't ordinary necessary. Now, but look, the fact that I pay something to a corporation that I own an interest in, that's not an ordinary necessary business expense, does not mean it won't represent income to the S Corp. Let's say that I own an interest, but I'm not really involved directly in, but I own an interest in a restaurant. And I go to the restaurant and I pay for a meal. Even though that's, let's say, not a business meal, I just go over there, you know, with a group of friends and I, I pay for their meals. That income, that's still income to the S corporation, even though not currently deductible to me. And that would be their argument here. It's still income to the S corp, even if the company doesn't get a current deduction. That's not the S corp's issue. They, they did what they were contracted to do. They're paid this much. They claimed on the return that this represented income that they had earned for doing for doing this thing. So, hey, got to live with it. So it could be very bad at the end of the day. Now, what this really means is the IRS, when they put these things out, 
they have two real purposes in doing so. Purpose number one is to, you know, make people leery of entering into these arrangements. So when the marketing people get to you, the idea being is that you will tell your client, well, the IRS is warning against this. And the IRS is as an implied threat in here, well, not so implied at points, uh, that they're going to examine these things and they're going to disallow it. That much they say very clearly. So, you know, your client's going to be told that I don't care what they're telling you about, you know, the promoter. I'm saying the IRS is saying they disagree with this entirely and they will disallow it. Now, does that mean they're going to win? No. And I always tell people that Pe people seem to think that there, there are these absolute tax answers that are, you know, that are what you give somebody. No. Tax law is uncertain. They might prevail. There may be one of these structures that actually works. But what I will tell the client is, is that the service has said right now they're going to go disallow it. That means that you probably are not going to be able to carry on exam. You're almost certainly going to lose this because the agent's not going against the national office. And they're probably been sent out on a project where their whole game, you know, their whole goal is to disallow these things. And they know that that's the answer. It's unlikely appeals will be much more helpful because chief counsel's office will have this as an issue designated for litigation and will essentially tell appeals not to compromise it. That, you know, we're going to court on this. We want wins on this. We believe we're going to win it. So tell them to go to court. Tell them this one, tough luck. There is no compromise here. Go to court, right? You're either going to have to give it up entirely or you're going to have to go to court, right? We're not going to give you any sort of intermediate solution. So your client's got to look at having to litigate this in court and potentially because, you know, the IRS has identified it at this level, even if they win at the trial court, whether that would be in a district court, tax court, whatever, they're almost certainly going to face an IRS appeal, which means they're going to have more legal expenses to fight the appeal. And if they lose, then again, obviously they would have to be the one to appeal in order to try to win. So you're looking at litigating through the Court of Appeals, most likely, to if you're going to win this. So if you get notice doing this, uh, then you would probably have to go that far. And it's very, very likely that if you try to just bail out and pay the tax right away, the IRS is going to say, and you have to pay penalties. Right? No, no waiver of penalties, no waiver of interest, you were warned. So, you know, in essence, be aware that, you know, it, there, it basically, yes, you can lose out. There is a potential harm by going for it. It's like, it's not that you have nothing to lose. So that's the key. And it also is, if somebody's already in a program like this, it's meant to get the advisor maybe now to start thinking about, well, maybe this doesn't work. You really have to tell the client that this has come out. And, you know, you might end up also advising the client about seeking counsel on whether or not, you know, what could be done to try to get them out of this. My guess is clients that come forward, and especially if there are no closed years involved, and just, you know, offer up they did this and pay the tax, pay any excise taxes due to overfunding a plan, uh, and take care of that stuff, will probably get a much better break than those they find. So we'll just have to watch for that one. But Yes, be aware the IRS is now after this sort of an ESOP program. So if your client comes to you with, you know, they were talking to somebody and he said, well, you should form a management ESOP, you know, and I got a buddy that, you know, will set that up for you and save you all these taxes. Paying taxes is totally voluntary. You don't have, you shouldn't be paying a cent, only chumps, right? Only the little people, to quote Ms. Helmsley, only the little people pay taxes and you're not a little person. So, you know, you shouldn't be paying taxes. Yeah, if they come in with that, you probably want to point out to them that there has been this guidance issued. And let's talk about the risks of going down this path. Next up, we're going to take a look at the case of Parker v. Commissioner, Tax Court Memorandum Decision, 2023-104, issued on August the 10th of 2023. In this case, we have an S corporation, and Mr. Parker is a shareholder of the S. Right. So we're litigating it for Mr. Parker uh, simply because that's where the tax is paid. But we're going to talk mainly about the S corporation for most of this. 
So it acquired real property. It planned to develop the property. Well, the plans didn't ultimately work out, but it had acquired it, and at least part of the debt they had used to acquire this land was lent to them on a non-recourse basis. And what that meant is the S Corporation was not liable to pay any shortfall in the repayment of the debt, it, you know, as long as the land was turned back over to this entity or turned over these these borrow these lenders, and if they weren't in first position, obviously the prior ones would have to be taken care of first. But essentially, they said, "Nope, we're not going to ask you for a cent beyond uh, whatever amount is on the loan." Now, it's not clear. It's possible that Mr. Parker may have, under the terms of this loan, been potentially liable for the shortfall. But the problem is he formed an S-corporation, or you know, at least he and a couple of other people did, formed an S-corporation, and that S-corporation entered into a loan agreement that says, as far as the S-corporation is concerned, this debt is non-recourse. You know, they have no recourse against any other asset of the S-corporation. So even if they do have recourse against Mr. Parker, for, you know, for him to repay it, the corporation is free and clear. And we, there, you know, we don't ignore these entities if you set them up. We might ignore them if we think they've been set up for the wrong reasons, but you can't disavow them is what was coming up here. So they abandoned completing the development, right? They sold off the land, but now here's the problem. The nasty thing about buyers of real property is they want clean titles. Now, remember, we're not giving the land back to the lender. Had we just dropped the land on the lender, that on a non-recourse debt pretty much gets rid of our liability because it was secured by the land. We gave them the land. They agreed they would not pursue us beyond what, you know, beyond the land, given getting back the land as the uh, way to pay off the debt. So the problem is the buyer is going to want that taken off. They're not going to want to continue with that debt out there where they can't really get rid of the land because the, this other party has a right to claim it, right? So we're going to want them to take their lien off the land. Well, generally that often happens because what we have here is what we will refer to as a short sale. And the short sale, not, not like shorting stock. In the real estate, the short sale means that, that you sell the property for less than the balance outstanding due against it. But, and when you do that, the lenders agree to waive, basically take the liens off. And in this case, because it's non-recourse, they also agreed to waive the balance because, let's be honest, right? If they turn down this short sale, then the borrower just hands them back the land. And when they hand them back the land, then the lender is going to have to now sell the property. Right now, they're being offered this all sold, done. They don't need to worry about it. It doesn't come back on their books. It's simpler. So, in essence, what ends up happening is, in that case, we end up with a, you know, at the time of the sale, they said the non-recourse debt was there. So the lender agrees to reduce the debts, take whatever they would get, whatever's left over by the time we get to their you know, by the time we got all prior claims taken care of, whatever is left over for them, even though it's less than what they what the total debt is, they will agree to waive that. Right? They're not. They're going to go ahead and release the lien, and they're not going to seek money from the original borrower. Right? So that allows the sale to go through, and that's apparently what we had here. It allowed everything to be done. Now. Here's the general rule. If a debt is non-recourse, and this is under section 1001, not non-recourse for partnership taxation, which is a somewhat different idea of non-recourse. And in partnerships, we actually get to both not non-recourse under this definition for 1001. We're looking inside the partnership, and then we look at the other definition of non-recourse when we're looking outside. So it's a bit messy. But the general rule is if property is subject to a non-recourse debt, and it's foreclosed upon by the lender, then the entire debt's considered part of the sales price, even if it's greater than fair market value. Standard rule under 1001 is any debt that is, you know, that, that you no longer have to pay 
due to the sale when you sell the property, that is considered to be part of your sales price, even though you're not going to get any cash, right? The fact that you no longer are liable on that debt, you're no longer liable to pay the debt. So essentially with a non-recourse debt, if you think about it this way, it's virtually like having a put option. If I don't like this land anymore and the debt outstanding is a non-recourse debt, I just have the right to tell the bank, hey, Chase, here, here's, here, you know, here, here's the deed, here's the land, it's yours, right? And I'm done. I have no more liability to Chase to pay off the rest of the debt. I'm assuming Chase gave me the loan, right? So I, I walk out of it that way. In that case, it's considered part of the sales price. And that's true even if the debt outstanding on the loan was, let's say, $2 million, the fair market value is only a million. And back in the late, uh, in 2008 through 2010, we really had cases like that that were at least that bad. Uh, where it looked like that, that would still be part of the sales proceeds, right? The entire million dollars. It, it would not, or you know, whatever, $2 million would be the entire part of the sales proceeds. It would be the million that, that we sold it for, right? The value plus the million that represents the excess of the debt over that fair value because Chase agreed that I got out of paying them $2 million if they would take the land. They would take the land in exchange for that debt. So basically, the full $2 million is part of the sales price, right? And the courts have also found that the same rule applies in a short sale for the reason I mentioned. You know, the, the seller is, or I should say, the lender is actually going to be financially better off if they agree to the short sale rather than forcing the foreclosure. If they don't agree to the short sale, then it's likely the owner of the property, you know, the person, the debtor, is simply not going to go through with the short sale, but rather is now going to just hand it back to the bank. And now the bank has to go out, find a buyer, and incur all kinds of extra costs now trying to get rid of it. They are offered a buyer. They have it right in front of them. They will evaluate it to see if that offer is reasonable, right? Is it actually what we can get in the market today? But as long as it's reasonable, you've taken care, you know, you've eliminated a lot of costs for them. So they will agree to reduce the debt. And we've had the ruling that even though that's from a structural standpoint, a reduction of the debt, followed by then a sale of the property at a lower price, in reality, they're saying, no, you, you should treat the two together. There's no reason why this should look different than the foreclosure. The only difference is in a foreclosure, the bank goes and finds the ultimate buyer. In this case, the buyer was in the transaction to start. So they're saying same difference, same treatment. The Briar Park case, and I've taught for a lot, taught especially a lot back during the big real estate debacle of 2008 through early 2010s. Uh, I taught courses on cancellation of debt rules and these sorts of things and 108 exclusions and the like. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about Briar Park, uh, which I believe was a case from the 90s. Uh, but it was a case that said non-recourse, but, you know, we have a short sale, it'll count. We're good. Now, the third option, remember, is if instead of us selling this, we say, you know, borrower, there's no way it makes sense for us to pay this. Um, you, you know, and I know the property's not worth this right now, Right. And it's, and we're not be able, we're not going to be able to go forward if you keep us having to pay, you know, the interest and have to pay off the principal of this, et cetera. It just won't make sense for us to operate. So lender, why don't you just go ahead and reduce the debt? If the lender agrees to renegotiate the debt and that, that, re, re, that results in effectively a reduction of the debt balance, even though the debt is non-recourse, if I keep the property, then I do have cancellation of debt income. Because what's happened was we've not had a sale or exchange, so it can't go to the sales price. And I've got a piece of land that I had agreed that I'd given $2 million, let's say, to buy. And I'd gotten that $2 million from the bank. Now, when I go back now and I'm going to get to keep that property, not by paying back $2 million of principal, but paying back a million, that would be a million dollar cancellation of debt. So that's the third issue. So the real catch here is going to be, was this reduction part of the sale or was it an independent transaction? 
Because if the reduction is cancellation of debt, Internal Revenue Code Section 108 allows you to exclude cancellation of debt from income if certain conditions are met under various circumstances. And one of those is if the borrower is insolvent at the time the debt is canceled. In this case, the S Corporation was insolvent. That's probably not surprising because you'd form one of these to be your development company. If that, if, if basically the value of the land has dropped like a rock, you know, it's not going to work. Odds are there is nothing else in the S Corporation except the land. So you're effectively insolvent if that land is not worth at least as much as the loan. And in this case, it's clearly not. So that, that is kind of where this comes in and how it works. So what ends up happening is, uh, you know, they want to say that they had the reduction of indebtedness and that that, that reduction of indebtedness served, uh, you know, would be eligible to be wiped out by cancellation of debt. Because alternatively, that amount's going into the sales price of the land. And depending upon how this was structured and how the borrowing got there, it's very possible that they might have borrowed this loan, some of this money, after they got the land. And potentially, the land went up in value for a while. So they may have amounts borrowed on the land in excess of the actual value of that land. And obviously, they could have used it for other things, like, you know, maybe other items they were using, you know, to acquire equipment and other items for developing, maybe pay some operating expenses, etc. But, you know, obviously, it's there. So in this, and in this case, it would be the case that if these, this amount that was forgiven is part of the sales price, then there would be a taxable gain on the sale, which would be a problem. Right? They don't like that. They're trying to use 108. But the court found the facts of the case made it clear the reduction of debt occurred specifically as part of the sale of the land. The lender had to get out of the way for the sale to go forward. This was not a case of the lender just reducing the debt with no strings attached. right? And so the developer could have just moved forward, now not having to pay nearly what he originally paid for the land. No, that, that's not what happened. This was all part of the sales proceeds. Because of that, that reduction in debt was added to the sales proceeds for tax purposes. And that also means no exclusion from income was going to be allowed in Section 108 because there was no cancellation of debt. Now, again, this emphasizes the fact that you have to understand that rules are different for cancellation of debt on disposal of secured property, normally real estate, because that's usually where these issues will arise, depending on whether the debt is recourse or non-recourse. And generally, for these purposes, a non-recourse debt is a debt where the lender agrees not to pursue any other items, anything else, if the debt's not paid, aside from the property securing the debt. As I say, that, that gives you a deemed put. So, this has been the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 7th, 2023. Grant for All Tax Developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. You can contact me by email if you have any questions at edzollers at currentforalltaxdevelopments.com. I also uh, spend some time reading and answering responses in certain Connect uh, sites for state CPA societies. That includes uh, connecting and talking to people and answering questions on sites that are run by the Arizona Society of CPAs, New Jersey Society, Illinois Society of CPAs, Minnesota Society of CPAs, and Washington. I you know, look in on those. And I also look in on the uh, anything that gets posted to the discussion group hosted by the Iowa Society of CPAs. So keep your eyes out there. Otherwise, we'll take a look at what's going to happen in this week in taxes. Uh, we're going to go past August 15th this week. So that means we will now be one month ahead of the first drop dead deadline. Yes, we're coming up quickly on those. And yes, I know it's like, seems like I need another like four months, right? No, you got to get the clients, get the stuff in. You got to get things rolling. So we got our partnerships ready to go. That's coming up in a month. So good luck there. It is August. So we don't expect huge amounts of developments. People, you know, DC kind of shuts down over August. So probably we'll have a few court cases. Maybe some minor things, but I'm 
expecting we won't see any major developments until Washington gets back from being on vacation and Congress gets back in to try to figure out what they're going to do first to keep the government open and then eventually could turn their attention to the year-end tax bill. But remember how this has worked every other year. That year-end tax bill will probably clear the end of the year. So don't expect anything fast. So whatever happens, though, we expect to see you next week here on Current Federal Tax Developments.